get used to. This is Wikipedia Weekly, episode 106 for November 16th, 2013. The Wikimedia Diversity Conference. So, welcome to another episode of Wikipedia Weekly. I'm your host, Andrew Lee, also known as user Fuzzhedo on the English Wikipedia. Hi, I'm Emily, user Kailana on the English Wikipedia. Hi, I'm Thomas, um, user Guillermo on the English Wikipedia. Well, thanks for joining us on a Saturday Wikipedia Weekly, which I don't think we've done in a long, long time. And we're happy to be joined by a new participant. Tom, welcome <laughs> to the group. Thank you. So what, before we get started, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe uh, some things that you've done recently in the Wikimedia community? Um, recently, I've been fairly inactive due to schoolwork, but um, I've been around Wikipedia since about 2009. Um, I'm an administrator, a member of the audit subcommittee, um, a former candidate of the arbitration, a uh, former ARBCOM candidate who didn't get through, and an administrator. That's Great. pretty much it. Lots of hats. Great. So, so later on the podcast, we'll talk a little bit about the upcoming ARBCOM elections, the state of affairs, and maybe some of the, the recent cases um, that we've talked about in this podcast. But first, I wanted to turn to Emily, who is amazing because she just took like a round trip flight to Germany while a full-time college student to attend the, is it the first ever diversity conference that took place? Yes. Yes, it is. It was fabulous. Um, and now that I'm finally sleeping and waking at normal people hours, it's, uh, it was a great experience. So tell us a little bit about the, the premise of it. And you were one of a number of folks who had applied or proposed something, they accepted it, and they flew you all in on a two-day conference in Germany talking about different different issues, not just gender gap, but all different types of diversity issues in the Wikimedia community, right? Yeah, there were a bunch of different tracks. Um, the talks, I, I know there were more talks that happened and that were interesting than what I could attend because there were two sessions going simultaneously, and, uh, you know, I'm one body, <laughs> so I could only go to half of the things that I wanted to see, but um, we talked about, obviously, gender diversity. We talked about um, inclusiveness with the LGBT community, specifically the trans community. We talked about the Global South. We talked about Africa specifically. We talked about India. We talked about the gender gap in India. Um, one really interesting proposal or talk was by um, one of the FDC members, Sydney Poor, um, user Flow Knight, on um, she was talking about mentorship and mentoring older Wikipedians as well as younger Wikipedians, which I thought was really, really interesting um, because there is a strong lack of age diversity. Um, yeah, so um, there were also a few workshop sessions where people who were working on diversity initiatives got to go through things that they were working on and receive feedback um, from other people there, which I found really valuable because um, you know, I'm running into issues here and there with my pilot program at Loyola, so it's really good to talk about you know, metrics and talk about um, different methods for bringing people into the fold. Um, yeah, it was really, really great. I learned a lot about Wikipedia. Um, Gerard was really busy about it, and um, it was really helpful being a um, crap. Yeah. So you, so you're talking about um, Wikidata, which I was kind of surprised was part of it. Um, you know, Wikidata, for the folks out there who know a little bit about it, you know, is the is the I guess the databasing of a lot of what happens in Wikipedia. Whereas previously this was all typed in stuff. It was lexical. It was, you know, not really structured data. But now the idea is that more and more of our stuff in the Wikipedia universe is geodata is stats, are population statistics, and all these things that you need to kind of, it's kind of better if you put it in a database and you can use it in the French Wikipedia, in, um, in all different types of projects. Uh, but what are, I, I guess I was surprised that Wikidata is there, but I guess it's kind of not because what was the angle on Wikidata being part of diversity? Um, so we were talking about how Wikidata could be used to find articles that were in other Wikipedias and not on English, or on English and not on other Wikipedias. Um, 
and they were talking about how to use database queries, which not a programmer, don't really understand, but the, some of the programmer folk there really helped me um, understand how powerful it is to find the intersection between, like, you know, people tagged female and people tagged botanist, or people tagged female and people tagged physicist. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use it as a tool for diversity, you know, finding, you know, women scientists on the French Wikipedia that aren't on the English Wikipedia or whatever, or whatever you're looking for. And mm -hmm. you can also create items on Wikidata that aren't on a Wikipedia. So you can use it as like a work list tool, you know, and put it, things in there as a database that don't yet exist as items on Wikipedia um, as an impetus for people to work on them. So I thought it was really cool. I'm really enthusiastic about it. Um, and once my awful chemistry test of doom is over, I plan to delve in really deeply and work on improving the data into women science so that it's easier to use for diversity purposes. <laughs> um, and once people start adding more efficient like ethnic background, um, it'll be great for looking at. Um, hmm. Oh, what are we looking wait, at? I'm oh. a, I'm a oh, so Wait, so, so Emily might have to get unwormed or un uh, robot again, but we're going to look at some of the things that she was talking about here. So her session is on women scientists, so anyone who's looked at this podcast before knows that that has a lot to say on women scientists and philosophers on English Wikipedia. Um, the other one that I saw that was kind of interesting here was economic diversity, um, collaborating with other open source communities, and... Um, let's see, Emily, there's another one here on engaging new editors. So a lot of this is, you know, bringing new folks to the mix um, and how to bring newbies in as part of diversity, right? It was interesting to see how much of the focus was on um, creating editors and not retaining editors. Um, there was some focus on editor retention, but I think... Um, at least in certain circles, the prevailing idea is that some turnover is necessary for a community's health, and, you know, we need fresh blood, which I do subscribe to. Um, not to say that we don't need people, you know, staying, sticking around for a long period of time, but I just think that people who aren't trusted in the community have a lot to offer. So I thought that, that was really helpful. Mm. Yeah, so what, what other things about the conference was it? So there's two days. Was it all talks? Did you have workshops? What were some of the outcomes, do you think, that, that were uh, um, coming out of it? So there were workshops where ideas were tabled. Yeah, let's see if your audio comes through now. Can we hear you? Sorry. Hello? You're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are getting better. Am I comfortable? Can we hear you? Can you see us? You can see us, but you can turn off. I can okay. see you. But you're going to turn off your, your camera and see. Hopefully that'll help. Let's see. Let's turn off. Okay. Well, your audio is a little bit better, so why don't you try again? Okay. Uh oh, uh -oh you stole a robot. Uh oh, so she's coming back. Um, hmm. I don't know. Okay, so while we wait for her to come back, Tom, did you have something to say? Not really. Um, diversity is important, and it'd be nice to have sort of a deeper group of contributors than what we already have, because there's... Oh, oh Emily knows what's wrong. That's good to know. It's that uploading a thousand images to Commons again. <laughs> Let me turn off my uh, screen share for a second here. All right, Emily, so you know what's wrong? 
Yeah, there was something streaming in one of the, like, 8,000 windows I had open. Uh, oh, I knew <laughs> it. I told you something's going on. I, I thought I killed everything that was streaming. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's so much better now. Okay. It was Con, there was Khan Academy hiding in the background streaming organic chemistry videos. Anger sure. <laughs> <laughs> Rampage! Okay. It's your classic uh, Wikipedia and thinking that you get three three streams of info into your brain at one time. So. Yeah, basically. Well, I'm, and I'm working on a big list of women scientists, and I'm also I've also got like 20 sources open for this genetic disease article I'm working on. So, yeah. All right, much better. Okay. Am so, I, um, okay, some back other, to DivCon. Some other highlights from DivCon. Um, I thought Katie Chan's talk on engaging and not being asshats to the trans community was really great. Um, she was she was talking about a lot of the transphobia that we see, and we had a nice little chat about Chelsea Manning. Um, which I thought was really valuable and tied with the talk that came right before her on, you know, outreach to the LGBT community. I thought it was a really good summation of what we need to do um, because that also ties into what I do with systemic bias. There's a ton of systemic bias against LGBT topics um, because, as we know, Wikipedia is written by cis, white, straight men. Um, so there are definite areas for improvement there. And I talk the usual talk about women scientists and philosophers. Um, there's not much that happened there that I have already harped about for ages on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It was getting feedback from people on other areas of systemic bias. Um, if you scroll down, there's a really cool talk um, about about engaging Africa. Um, I don't know what one there. Africa and gender, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't do a test that's called a nose from it. Um, it was really cool to talk to the senators um, um, who are working on Africa. Did you, uh, were you able to limit your bandwidth there? Yeah. Okay, hope we can get you back again. It's still a little wormy. I'm so you, you got to cut out a few more videos of uh, Orgo back there. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So when we get Emily back, we can go back to DivCon for a second, but... Let's talk a little bit about what I was talking to Tom before about, which was on ARBCOM, which was, <laughs> um, wow, we're in the middle of the nominating period of ARBCOM, right? We're like, what, 10? I think it's very brief. It's less than two weeks, right, Tom? It, it's less than two weeks. Um, the nomination period ends this Tuesday at midnight UTC. Don't we only have nine candidates for nine seats? I think we have eight candidates. We have eight candidates for nine seats, but you have to remember that the majority of candidates for ARBCOM elections always come in the last three or four days. Right. So we're, That's true. I, compared to last year, we're only one candidate behind, which doesn't seem as bad if you look at it, because we had about double the candidates to seats last year. Which is good, because otherwise we'll end up with an ARBCOM with YOLO swag on it, and we can all imagine how that would go. <laughs> Didn't he get 10% of the vote last year? It was like 7%. <laughs> well, one of the things I was talking to Tom about before, so one is that it's interesting that this ARBCOM election is coming on the heels of some, how to put it charitably, some more controversial ARBCOM decisions that, um, especially with the, the CLA 68 case and um, Phil Sandifer. And then mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, I started seeing was a lot of bickering over ARBCOM election guides. So I guess in the last few elections, there's a there's a, now a big culture of users in Wikipedia taking all the candidates and rating them whether you should or should not vote for them. And then now there's kind of a an extra meta war about whether people should actually be recommending the guides of other people who are giving advice about voting on ARBCOM, which gets a little bit complex. But I guess this. It's kind of interesting that there's that many people interested in ARBCOM that you now have fights over guides to ARBCOM voting. Um, 
So what do you folks think about this in terms of the culture that we have now of voting guides and criticism of voting guides? Well, I... So last year I did run for our company. The year before that, I wrote a voter guide. I didn't have time to, con to finish it, but I got three-fourths of the way through it. Um, mm -hmm. They do take lots of time, yeah. and there is some use to them. And if you look at the people that the guide support, the guy, the people that the guide support, oftentimes, if most of the guide writers support them, they end up on ARBCOM. So there does seem to be some power to these this institution. Um, meta guides are, are a long-standing sort of tradition where I think the ruling still is is that you can't link them from the template but you can write one, and I you might be able to add it to the category two about mm -hmm. guides. Right, and there was a, some controversy because there was a banned user who actually, you know, is banned from editing Wikipedia, but he still wanted to put a, a voting guide to ARPCOM on his talk page. I think in the end, they, did they take it down? Which, um, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. It went to ANI, and I think... He, his access to his talk page was removed, but I'm not sure. Right. I try not to follow ANI. <laughs> I check my watch list about once a week now, and my life is just so much calmer. <laughs> I, like, delve into my little women scientists content hole, and uh, it's great. It's great. No AN, no ANI. I'm a terrible administrator, kids. Don't follow. Don't follow my lead. I'm one of the admins who doesn't do any work. <laughs> um, but on the topic of ARPCOM guides, part of me thinks that it's just such a huge waste of time. Like, let everybody read the things for themselves and make their own decisions, because writing guides like this encourages partisanship and encourages clickiness, both of which I find antithetical to how Wikipedia works, but very much in line with how humans actually work. <laughs> um, which I don't think is necessarily a positive thing. So, uh, I feel like, go write an article. That's, <laughs> that's always going to be my answer when people start doing meta, meta. Yeah. Go write an article. And um, the guides sort of contribute to a culture where lots and lots and lots of questions are asked to candidates of the... Um, candidates who want to be arbitrators, that people, f I don't think people read all the questions because uh -huh. there's a thousand of them, because they can just read the guides where people have already read all of the questions. So it seems that it encourages asking tons of questions and then nobody except the guide writers, most of which who ask the questions, talking about the candidates' answers to their section of questions. Right, and I think that's an even bigger time sink because it encourages the people who are running for ARBCOM to spend all of their time on meta stuff rather than, you know, contributing to the encyclopedia. We are an encyclopedia, and the sort of, as the old saying goes, and the main thing that, that we're supposed to be doing is writing it, and everything else is, is secondary. I believe very strongly in that philosophy, but... I know things would fall apart if people didn't do admin things, but sometimes I wonder if things would fall apart if, you know, we had ARBCOM elections where people made statements and that was kind of that. I think, I think the questions are good because sometimes you have to tease out, so what is... So what does AGK, for instance, think about issue one, this issue about, if you, especially if they've never sat on ARBCOM before, you kind of need to think about how they're going to vote. Now, a lot like with the Supreme Court itself, which ARBCOM is always thought of as our version of it, which it really isn't. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that you never know how people are going to vote until they start sitting on the bench. Um, and people's right. opinions change wildly after they have to deal with the back end of Wikipedia. Right. 
Uh oh, we're losing. We're losing, uh, we're losing you again, Emily. Oops, she left us. But I thought I'd show you the uh, the current slate of folks. We have eight folks. Um, hopefully, as you said, though, you know, you're probably going to get a burst of four to eight candidates at the end. Um, yeah. So we'll probably have a decent slate. Now, tell us a little again what what the criteria here. You need to have over fifty percent approve. Is that right? Um. So the. <clears throat> The seats are dealt out as in the t this year the top nine the top eight people will end up getting two year seats, and then and the ninth person will get a one year seat. Mm -hmm. But even if you're in um if you're in fourth place and have less than fifty percent of the vote, you don't get a seat. If that makes any sense, so you have to have above the fifty percent mark, but not everybody above the fifty percent mark gets a seat. Ah, so we cannot have an ARP come with YOLO swag on it. In theory, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if the entire community all decided to, you know, take a brain vacation for the entire voting period, then maybe. But that's another story. I'll I'll stop. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to find out. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to find out if we're going to get the the whole the whole state. I mean, it's, it looks like the analysis of this is that it's a little bit le a little bit behind what we had last year, but if the numbers hold up, then we probably will have enough to make a, a whole state of nine folks. So. I think in the last three or four days of the ele of the nomination period, four, three to four people a day nominate themselves. So we're going to we're going to have more than nine candidates running by the end of the nomination period. It'll be interesting to see how many above that mark we end up we end up going to get. Right. right. Now, um, just a quick update on the Phil Sandifer situation, which has gotten a lot of uh, I don't know about a lot of movement, but a lot of little things have changed over the last two weeks. But uh, but Tom, what is your read on where that case is, and does it make a difference that such a weird case um, came up before the Arbcom elections? Well, interestingly, it seems that every year drama happens dealing with ARBCOM just before the elections. So <laughs> last year there was the Ellen of Rhodes sort of issue where certain information left the ARBCOM mailing list. And there also was the um, Malleus Fatorium, who is now going under his real name, which I don't remember. <laughs> Yeah, um, so he there was a big thing where he where there was a motion to ban him that came up, and he he didn't get banned, but that played into a big role in last year's election. Mm -hmm. So there always is a big, very controversial action that Arbcom does right before the elections, at least in my memory. It's if you ask James Forrester, he might know a lot. Better. <laughs> I'm gonna get Emily to type in her question so we can see it. Because <laughs> you can't hear you. <laughs> type in your question. We'll we'll put it on there. So um. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can hear it clicking. That's good. <laughs> you type faster. <laughs> well, now, now we can hear you, so you can say it. Oh, okay. I think it's <laughs> I think it's the same way that we ask ARPCOM candidates how they would vote in XYZ case. The same way that we ask bureaucrat candidates how they would close XRFA or XRFB, and how we ask RFA candidates whether they would delete this article or block this username, you know, we yeah. that's our that's our way of testing because we we don't know how they're going to vote till they get on the bench, like Tom said. Yeah, I'm wondering what what who do you think actually vote? I mean, is it just a self-selecting crew of folks who even get involved with voting for ARBCOM so that it's actually not even a decent slice of what Wikipedians think? There's a watch list notice. I, th I forget the numbers last year, but there was a decent number of people. It wasn't that 100 people voted. 
but I don't remember off the top of my head the number of people that voted, but it has come down in recent years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was like 700 last year, I think, and it wasn't all of the, you know, regulars, which I think is good. More voter diversity is good. Right. Right. So some of the some of the things that happened with the Phil Sandifer case, um, as we talked about, what, two weeks ago or even last week? Or, yeah, two weeks two ago. Two weeks ago. Um, was that um, Phil actually has modified his blog post to take down the actual... I guess, um, I want to say city-level location information for CLA 68. As you remember, the, one of the controversies was whether he actually outed or doxed um, CLA 68. And the, one of the arguments was that this was information that you could get um, fairly quickly if you look back in the history of what CLA 68 had written. He had put some of the stuff on his own user page. He had made some edits to meetup pages, which says, oh, I'm here in this prefecture or wherever it is, we can meet up. And then there were a few edits where he accidentally edited without logging in, revealing the IP address, and if you did some correlation, you kind of figure out where he actually was. So that, that, that I guess, was the ambiguity as to whether he was actually outed, quote-unquote, by um, Phil, although I think even if you're quite sympathetic to Phil, you have to say that it's a little bit... Um, it took a, quite a bit of work to piece all that information together. And normally, by Wikipedia standards, if you do that much work, it is kind of doxing or the equivalent of doxing. So, um, so Phil's removed the particular piece of information, but without any comment, really. Um, and then he actually had a follow-up blog post that said, yeah, I outed and I doxed uh, CLA 68, but it was in the public interest. So what do you folks think? Tom, especially, I'd like to hear what you think, because we haven't heard from you before on this. So since Phil actually used the word, I doxed and outed someone, um, you know, I helped write the signpost piece two weeks ago, so we actually got a note from one or two of the arbitrators saying, hey, how come signpost used outed in quotes or alleged outed when Phil admitted that he outed the person? What is your read on, on that case, Tom? My biggest issue is that um, this is very inconsistent for ARBCOM. Hmm. This ARBCOM has dealt with this issue from multiple cases, Wikipediocracy comes to mind, um, with some of their blog posts, and yet they have always refused to take up the case. Hmm. Yet now, in um, CLA 68's block earlier this year, had to do with that, that he linked to a blog post that had non-public information about a person on it. Um, but the sort of bad thing is, is is that, at least in my mind, that I'm sort of okay with the desysop, but the ban doesn't really make sense because Arbcom has always turned down all these nonamins who have done similar sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, they've always said no comment, it's off wiki, so we can't do anything. Right. So now... Um, it's, again, off-wiki. Normally they would say, we can't do anything, but now they're jumping on this train to ban people, which doesn't make any sense because the first half of the year they were saying the exact opposite. Right. So did they just have amnesia, or was there anything specific in this case that kind of made them tip over the edge to do something? The only way we would know if we would see their internal mailing list, and we're not going to get that information. So I don't think more information outside of the individual votes of people who lots of people have surprisingly stated their reasoning outside of if outside of those I don't think we could ever know so it is possible that there's some information they can't make public that they kind of used in their decision possibly. it's highly possible mm-hmm. um, Emily any new insights on this after two weeks since um, this all I think I think Tom said it well. I don't honestly have a lot to say, and I haven't I haven't been able to follow all of the ARPCOM like notice board drama because you know chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been following it, but at the same time, since during my time as a clerk, I've always found that the sort of the the ARPCOM notice board drama isn't always something that you want to look at because it just makes you unhappy. 
that n there is no such thing as anything that happy that pops up on that notice board. And actually, it's kind of interesting that if you look at lots of the complaints that people have about ARBCOM, the people that are complaining changes, but the complaints never really do. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting, I thought, was one of the ARBs, Arbitration Committee members said that if Phil takes down that one chunk of information, he'd be willing to kind of reverse his decision on it. So it was kind of interesting that Phil took it down without any explanation. So whether Phil was angling to get reinstated, which would seem kind of odd because he's not really that active anyway and he just didn't seem that bothered, um, or whether he just thought it was the right thing to do was not to put that information up there anymore. It's kind of interesting. Even if the information was public, the fact that Phil has said time and time again throughout his blog posts that I doxed him, <laughs> he, he, at least in the mind of Phil, he was outing CLA 68. So even if that information was public, the sort of intent is there to out him, which is almost worse <laughs> than the action itself. Right, but then some other folks brought up the fact that there's a weird little loophole, I wouldn't say loophole, but a provision in the doxing and outing policy saying that if you're outing someone to to discuss um, COI, conflict of interest, right, like you're, you're revealing someone's identity because you truly believe that their association in real life with something compromises their ability to be neutral um, and as a conflict of interest in Wikipedia, then you can do that um, in the, I guess the, I think the wording was appropriate forums, and I think that was the defense that Phil put out, saying this is in the public interest. Uh, this person is associated with the U.S. military, and why should this person be editing the Chelsea Manning article in good faith? If let's say, you know, you take David Gerard's argument that you know we were penalized for knowing trans people, so somehow that either didn't resonate with the ARBCOM folks, or they just kind of overlooked it, or maybe it doesn't apply? Any any opinions from you folks? I pulled up the harassment policy, and after appropriate so forums, it says if re if removed or oversight personal identification, blah, if basically non-public information is involved, you should email an administrator an ARB directly, mm -hmm. but do not publish it on Wikipedia. So I think the same thing is true, where um, it should have went directly to ARBCOM, and shouldn't have gone public. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very possible. Maybe he did contact some folks, either admin or ARCOM, and didn't get the results he wanted, and maybe went public that way. We won't, I guess we won't know unless we really get to see those emails. And I don't think we ever will. <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is certainly a complex case with lots of nuances and, you know, different policies that, that overlap. So... Um, there hasn't been much chatter in the last few days on this, so it looks like it's just all died down. And maybe the and th can I just like point this... something out? Oh, sorry, yeah. Tom. I was oh. gonna say things like this die down within a few weeks, anyways. So you can't expect the chatter to continue endlessly. Right. Well, there's that, and also I think um, hopefully I'm not robot-y. That you're not. <laughs> Yay! Um, <laughs> that every time something like this happens, we're all like, oh my god. Oh my god, it's the end of Wikipedia, it's the end of Wikipedia governance, and then three weeks later, everybody's like, whatever. <laughs> and that's what happened here, that's what happened with Wikipr, that's what happened with SJ, it happens every single time. Just an observation. There is, there is sort of a push that every issue, everything that ARBCON does is always wrong, and it always is the end of Wikipedia as we know it, and then a new and then it never is. It's elected the next year. And Wikipedia People do is like still here. Go. Yep. So we just have a conflated self of our uh, sense of our self-importance in this whole area, and we think that as insiders or people who kind of know a lot we can sense the end of Wikipedia much earlier than everyone else, where we probably <laughs> have learned multiple times now. You know, it's so big that it's going to take a lot for this thing to come diving down nose first. 
Yeah, so uh, let's see. Uh, what were the other things that we're going to talk about? One was uh, the... Well, anything else to say about the ARBCOM elections? Anything that we should know before the elections take place? So the nomination period is over soon, but then how long before the actual elections? I would need to look, but I, but there's a decent amount of time between that's just for asking questions and answering questions before the end of the questioning period. Mm -hmm. um, one sec, I'll pull this up. Yeah, 19th of November is the last day for nominations, and then... I'm trying to look at Let's the see, whole... timeline... So until the 19th is is the nomination period, and then voting doesn't start until the 25th of November. So there is sort of a little bit of time in between um, where voting hasn't started, yet nominations aren't open for asking questions, answering questions. Um, voting ends on December 8th this year, and then the scrutineering period probably will go on at least last year, it went on for a long time, so it's probably going to go on from the about the 9th of November, 9th of December, until maybe about Christmas time. Mm. Yeah, that's what happened last year, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so moving on. Yeah, let's talk about uh, featured content. I thought that was kind of interesting to see, um, or just to note some of the interesting featured content that is been uh, showcased this past uh, signpost. Um, so there were nine pictures that were upgraded to featured, and I thought one of them was really cool, which is this gigantic scroll, which was some crazy dimensions. 30,000 pixels by 1,000 <laughs> pixels, which was really wild. So I'm I not going to try and load that right now. It no. It made my browser barf for a little while, but... <laughs> It's worth showing because normally you don't see images this big, but it's a Chinese scroll, so it is pretty cool because, um, I don't know if you're seeing it on the screen there, but it is, you know, something you scroll wide, and it's 10,000 pixels wide. Holy so, crap. But it's cool. I guess it became PD, and you can see... I'm not going to... I, I saw it. I was like, oh, I should open this. <laughs> the day that it's picturing the so day cool. will be interesting. Yeah, I, I'm just imagining the outcry when we crash everybody's browsers because they try to look at the picture full size and. Oh, holy God! I'm imagining the flood of OTRS emails. You guys broke our browser. <laughs> what about ah! No, I'm saying not ten thousand, thirty thousand pixels wide. So it's like holy thirty times wider than this tall. Um, but this is great. This is what Wikipedia is good for. Is showcasing That's so stuff. cool. It's like really how many cool. hours of scanning that takes, though. Yeah, I don't even want to think about that. I don't know. What's, nope. what's cool is that, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you've... Um, I, I, I was quite shocked when I saw a scroll like this when I was visiting the National Museum in Taiwan. This was actually, um, actually before Wikimania 2007. And it was really cool because I didn't realize what they did at the time, but you have some scrolls like this that have these little red chops, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. seen that, that little square square down there. And what they used to do is that when they found, you know, you used to have a very famous poet write a poem on a scroll, and then for people or, or famous poets or authors later on who were inspired by that poem, they would take a chop of their own and chop it on, on the original document, which is basically almost like a Facebook-like of that <laughs> that prose. So the cool thing is that you can walk through the museum and the, the scrolls with like 5, 10, 15, 20 chops on them with 20 like little red things on top of it are actually the ones that are most popular, meaning that they were the ones that are inspirations for other writers out there. And this was ba done back in like the 16th century. So the Facebook like <laughs> button is actually uh, a very modern incarnation of what used to be done you know, back then in Chinese literature, which is kind of weird. But, but kind of cool. Yeah. Or it's like the Wikipedia thank button. You know. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of kind of fun to see. That. You've returned to your robotic state, generally. Yes, you've regressed to robotics, and 
we should probably go to the next section, which which Emily's really looking forward to. So I hope we can actually do it with her. Um, so the next section that we're going to talk about is the top 25 articles that she really wants to get into. So let's see. Let's go to the top 25. What is our top 25 of this week? So Emily, are you back? We're about to talk about the top 25 articles. So I you... am, and I have things to say. Okay, I... so we're looking at the top 25. Let me get on the screen here. So what were the interesting top 25 articles mm. this week? So all top five were Google Doodle related. Hmm. And Why? More shock? Um, well, go to go to Wikipedia colon top twenty five. Oh, yeah. That's that's the one with. Do you see that um, one? This yeah. One. Yes, that one. So all all top five were from a Google Doodle. Mm -hmm. Um, plus the India effect, which equals record numbers. I think. Um, what was it? Franz Kafka had the record. It was like two million. Mm hmm. Um, when it was main page and Google Doodled on the same day, but this just totally shattered it. So huh. that's interesting, and that is a pet peeve of mine: is that Google Doodle has such diversity in who it talks about, women of color, people who aren't from the West, all of these awesome things. You know, women scientists, lots of women scientists, and then in like Wikipedia articles, and Wikipedia articles are crap. Like Maria Mitchell had a Google Doodle. Maria Mitchell was a customer app. So you're saying right. that the uh... oh Maria Mitchell. Oops, let me get my uh, let me get my Google Doodle back up again. Or the uh... top twenty-five. Sorry, get that top twenty-five back up again. Were you seeing it before? I think you're seeing it now. Hopefully, yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, this nine million is really—that's really high. Yeah. That, and so I think what Emily's point was that not only was it the Google Doodle, but maybe once the word started getting around, hey, it's someone from India, then you passed it around to folks in India and suddenly it got even higher numbers than before. Um, but even the Rorschach at 4.5 million is pretty darn high. That's yeah, um, and then the industrial designer whose name, whose last name I can't, don't think I can pronounce, right, is like another... Right. Yeah. Okay, can I... Go. Yeah. Can I just point out the comments on Guy Fox Night? Can you scroll down and can we read that description? What happened? There's scroll a... down. Uh huh. Oh, eleven. This yep. is actually interesting. This is hilarious. Britain's determinedly non-PC holiday, in which children celebrate the failure of an attempt to blow up the Houses of Parliament 400 years ago by burning a Catholic in effigy while chanting death slogans, fell on 5th November. <laughs> Thanks to the efforts of nannying killjoys who think that children <laughs> waving sparklers while standing next to an open bonfire is potentially dangerous, this tradition is slowly losing ground to Halloween. Ironically, an import from Catholic Ireland by way of the US. Wow, that is like that is like a whole like chapter of history in like two sentences. Not only that, but wow. Just the <laughs> sheer <laughs> POV of that. <laughs> Wait, who maintains this page again? Serendipitous. Where is he based? Ser Must be Serendipitous. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's time for some wiki stalking. That's that's like some <laughs> that's some tight writing you only find like the Economist. So uh, that's uh, really interesting. <laughs> the Economist. He is from London, yes. Yes. Or she. Okay. He, he or, or she. she. That's true. Not sure. Hey. Well, that's funny that he's lamenting the fact that Halloween is, is encroaching on UK, which I didn't know that was the case. So with Gal Guy Fox Knight and Guy Fox, although there's a typo there, it's probably 467,100. Um, got some pretty high numbers. Put together, it's a million, practically. Yeah. 
Um, and it's a it's a very well written article too. So for mm-hmm. um, it was written by I think Parrot of Doom and and Malleus together, and it's part of a huge sort of featured topic just about the whole fifth of November plot, where they're really nicely written articles. So at least. Um, one of the things that I I lament about is you look at the this top twenty five and look how poor the quality of lots of these articles are. You see, mm-hmm. you at least see a featured article in there or a good article. What is that orange circle for class? Uh, so that's a something? start. That's so a start. Oh, it's nine million people saw a start. stub in a C class. Oh, God. Meaning there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. But isn't this pathetic? I mean, in in some way for us, I mean, that this is a Star Class article. It is number one this past week. It's nine point some million viewers that we could be trying to get in and look at the status. It's semi-protected. I mean, I'm not saying that, that we should... I mean, I know what happens if you leave it completely open you get all kinds of crap. But um, if it's star class, shouldn't we be sucking in new contributors to try to do something with it rather than putting up the hand? Uh-oh, we're getting robot on you. Or are you getting robot on us? Surprisingly, the, if looking at the um, references to this, mm-hmm. there are some really high-quality references here. So... It would be very possible to to have this as a um, GA or at least B class. Yeah, it doesn't seem it, to be a start class to me. But, I mean, it's short, but I would put it more. Oh, looking on the talk page, it's been bumped up to C class, oh, okay. which makes a little bit more sense right. because start class normally has maybe one section break, but it isn't. It has at least paragraphs. Mm-hmm. When you start getting into section breaks with multiple paragraphs of each section break, you're more into C, B, G, A sort of class. Right. I mean, this this is something we this is something we talked a little bit about at Wikimania, where I think this has dawned on a number of folks at the Wikimedia Foundation who work on user experiences that when you do have super popular articles, whether the Google Doodle points to them or something else and you put a protected or semi-protected lock on it, when a average or a new user clicks on edit, instead of just putting up a, sorry, you can't edit this page, you're not a user that has a, a, an auto-formed account, then shouldn't you do something else? Like, shouldn't you put up uh, something a little bit more friendly or encourage them to edit another article that is not protected or something? I don't know what we can do, but is that a lost opportunity, do you think, Tom? Yes and no. At the same time, you <clears throat> I do know if you watch sort of the featured articles community, some of them almost lament on the fact that some of their articles get put on the front page, mm. that it's the one time that people then look at it, and then in the minds of some of the writers, people start playing with it, and the quality drops. That's a problem. So... <clears throat> I, I sort of get that opinion. I mean, I get the idea of sort of you let anybody touch it and then it all fa- falls downhill from there. But at the same time, it would be nice to get more writers, but it's hard to get the good stuff and none of the bad stuff is the other problem because of our overly... <clears throat> our vandalism fighting system is almost too good for its own good. Right. And it seems that anything by an IP these days is considered vandalism in the eyes of some of the vandal fighters. So, even our normal system doesn't really work anymore, which is saddening. It used to be able to sort of keep the good stuff and remove the bad stuff, but it seems that everything is seen as bad in the eyes of the people doing vandalism work. Right. I'm I not sure what you see, Emily. 
I, I, <laughs> my perspective is a former avid vandalism fighter. Um, I do find that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> um, and experiments by people, experienced editors doing good stuff as IPs and things that I've seen with new users like sitting next to me making clearly good edits that get reverted, it, yeah. it's, it's frustrating. Um, and I think we've tried putting an invitation. I seem to remember there being a like featured article for improvement kind of thing on the main page, but I know that was an idea, and I know it's been floated. I just don't know how well it worked out. Um, so that's it been one idea. It actually is on the main page now. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, it's a once a week thing, I think, a lot oh, so like, like a, the featured list. Like featured list. Okay. Um, do you know how it's been working in getting people to contribute? I I don't know. Is I can only spend so much time on Wikipedia, and <laughs> that project wasn't one of the things. I, I got you. It wasn't one of my things either, so I guess neither of us can speak to it. Wait, so you're saying the featured ar article for improvement is on the front page now? I, I think for a while. Mm -hmm. I think it is once a week, maybe. I, I see it over the Twitter feed mm. that... Yeah, I see it on Twitter. This occasionally. week's article for improvement is whatever. You should mm -hmm. go. You should go edit it. Um, trying to look to see where we can find that. That's a good idea, though. Just give someone easy, low-hanging fruit for the page. I was, it's kind of interesting. Today's t featured article is the Heidi football game. Which is, do you guys know what that is? I didn't until I read the article <laughs> half an hour ago. Oh, okay. So you, you read it recently. So. Yeah. Yeah, this is the, uh, for, for Emily, this is the football game between the New York Jets and Raiders before the era of, like, 500 cable channels, so... Um, they, they were scheduled to show Heidi <laughs> on TV on NBC at that exact 7 p.m. and this this like really close game was coming down to the wire and then he cut away from it and showed Heidi instead of the football <laughs> <other football> game, <laughs> which was like seen as the Waterloo of sports TV. It's like we shall <laughs> never ever cut away from a live football game ever 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 again because they got so much hate mail and phone calls to the oh station God. saying what happened to the football game because there's no internet. Like you, you like couldn't even like go to the net and follow like what the score was. You just had to like, who knows, you know, read it in the newspaper. Read the yeah. newspaper the next day yeah. or whatever. Oh my god! Just think about that. Sixty. If we're talking about featured content, can we talk about last week? The fact that um, military history got battle cruisers to a to the to a featured um, for a to featured topic. Group? Featured topic. Yeah, featured topic. It's like sixty. Which some. has like fifth. Yeah, 60 something. Articles. Yeah, it's awesome. Where's <clears throat> but, where's Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so tell tell us the significance of that again. Um, it's the biggest featured there topic is... ever. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm it was written up in Signpost this past week, right? Mhm. Mm yeah. So, 60, I think most of those 60-something articles are featured articles. So people did a whole lot of work within the that that topic area and ended up being able to pass it through featured topics, which is really cool because FAs are really hard to get. I've looked at it and said no. <laughs> I just I, I can't do that. So it's amazing that people were able to do it. Yeah, I'm really impressed. But Majestic Titan is doing is moving forward in leaps and bounds with their ability to turn battleships and battle cruisers into good and featured articles. All right. So Majestic Titan is this thing. Coding for long-term collaboration that will improve Wikipedia's coverage of all battleship and battle cruiser related articles. You know, the funny thing is, so so Emily knows, but Tom, you may not know, I'm teaching a class next semester which is dedicated to Wikipedia editing. And oh, cool. if I'm going to be t talking to students who are very new to Wikipedia, how do I explain why there is so much 
passionate activity around battle cruisers and battleship stuff to the point where it can reach this kind of status, you know, with this many featured articles. And what is it that creates this culture? I I don't know. I thought Eddie <laughs> was a seventy-year-old Navy veteran until I met him at Wikimania and found out that he was only a few years older than me. So, but the amount of work that he's done is is really impressive, and I don't know what takes why there's so many people, but military history, the entire topic area, is really well done. Right behind roads and trains seem to be other really good topic areas, but then women scientists, like what Emily likes writing about, or folk music, which I've done some work in, seems to be a very sparse area. Emily, any... uh... I mean, they try and they've been doing really great work. Um, they're, as far as I know, all men writing about military history it was very typical in that sense. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm not diminishing their achievement at all. They did something really, really awesome. But I highly doubt that you'll be seeing a feature topic on like female biologists anytime soon, just because you know. Gender gap. It is something weird. I mean, I have twin boys, so I kind of saw it from the very beginning. Like some of trains and vehicles and whatever. Something weird is wired into the brain at that point, and I don't know what it is. Um, so uh, it starts very young, and it gets obsessive, and it gets. I guess this is what happens when boys start playing with trains and planes, and it just grows up in this big obsession that you get up to Wikipedia levels. So. Uh, if you look at the stuff I've written, though, I have two my my four good articles. Two are on nuns that have spent time in prison. That's awesome. And one is of a of a Celtic punk record, and then one is a folk song about the major city near me, when I, at home. So that's cool. I'm not saying all dudes only write about military history, but I feel like part of the the popularity of Milhist is due to the fact that they're the overwhelming majority of Wikipedia editors are male. Well, Milhist is interesting itself that that um, an academic historian did a talk at Wikimania in, when it was in, D, in when it was in DC. Mm-hmm. In his sort of criticism of Milhist in for Wikipedia is, well, we are history as Barnes and Noble sees history. Mm-hmm. It has very little to do with what a real historian would write about. <laughs> we like the battles and the big leaders, things that have that people write books about. We don't have the role of women in, in an event or how the war at home changed the war on the battlefield, things that he... He talked about a lot about. Yeah. Um, he also liked talking about maps, which, as somebody that does GIS, made me very happy. But I could never make maps that, like he was talking about. No. Which is pretty much Adobe Illustrator. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm an MS Paint kind of girl, so. <laughs> <laughs> Like, my Photoshop skills are limited to cutting out, you know, somebody's head and, like, in, like, some blobby shape and moving it onto a stick figure. That's, like, the extent of my skills. We're just making lol cats. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes even that's hard. I screwed up making a, uh, a Shiba the other day. Yeah. Can I just say that if we should take a picture of you right now, Emily... And for the article on college dorm room, you have, like, every cliche <laughs> thing, including, like, soda, toaster, uh, messy bed, TV. <laughs> well, that's not a messy bed. It's not mine. The messy bed is not mine. That's my roommate. Like, Tisha's looking mom. over at her bed that's actually messier. <laughs> no, my mom watched Wiki for our listeners, um, one of which might be my mom. My mom watched our last Wikipedia episode live. 
and I get uh, while you know I had Facebook open while I was podcasting, and I get a like little notification like you know mom messaged you. I was like, what? She's like, clean your room. <laughs> 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 you need to make your bed. Your sheets are hanging all over. I was you're, like, you're podcasting the world a dirty bedroom. <laughs> I don't want to let people know I raised a daughter who would keep her room like that. So. <laughs> Interestingly, much. you're looking in my dorm room and you can't see any more than like an American flag and a English flag behind yeah. me. Are we not seeing the mess? <laughs> I mean, it's fairly well contained today. <laughs> see, I'm in the middle of... This week is edit-a-thon and giant exams, so our method of cleaning involves putting things on the floor <laughs> and stepping <laughs> over them. This week for me, last week for me was giant exams and then 10-page paper of feminist criticism of emo music. So. so I'm sure you were really active on Wikipedia. Nope. Oh no. See, I use Wikipedia as procrastination. Kids, don't be like me. <laughs> <laughs> Clean your rooms. And don't edit Wikipedia when you don't want to write a paper. Write your papers. Actually, Public service message. <laughs> I, I don't procrastinate via writing. I procrastinate via... I start, on, I start on a Wikipedia page of the thing I'm writing about, and I say, ooh, this link looks interesting. And then you fill up all of your tabs across Ooh. the top of your browser. <laughs> I do and that too. And then you find yourself in really strange places. <laughs> or you try to get from wherever you are to Hitler. <laughs> That's a fun game. And then the click on the first link in an article until you get to philosophy. That one's pretty It cool. nearly always works its way back to philosophy. It's really strange. Yeah, that is yeah. cool. Also, there's a Six Degrees of Wikipedia game. That's fun. Six Degrees of Wikipedia? Yeah, you open two tabs and you click on random article in both of them and you try to get from one to the other in six steps. And you usually end up going through, like, philosophy or Hitler. <laughs> 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 Can you tell I have too much time on my hands? Yeah. <laughs> Watch it. Okay, you have just given me inspiration for my first day of class exercise for the students. <laughs> Excellent. Six degrees of, of Wikipedia. That's a great idea, actually. Excellent. See, I knew there was a good, there was a good reason why I had you on here, Emily. So. <laughs> Excellent. All right, great. So any last recommendations or podcasters' picks? Write about women scientists, please. Are there any, um, <clears throat> are there any anthropologists on there? Yes. Yes, I have a list. It is at user Kalana slash female scientist list. Okay. And I can I can send you scans of books. This is a this is a public offer. I will send people <laughs> scans of like the two pages of, of a woman's biography in a biographical dictionary if he or she is willing to write about that woman. Okay. Um Hit me up. Hit me up. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's um, all we got. <laughs> <laughs> Vote in the ARBCON elections and yes. actually read. Don't work off of other people's. Oh, but it's but the it's probably it's so like splintered in different areas. It's it's actually not that easy to track down all that information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But thanks for for joining us on a Saturday night. And yes. um, what's my last recommendation? I have one recommendation. Uh, <laughs> What was I looking at? Oh, an unusual article. So uh, one of the things I'm always look on lookout for is unusual articles because one of the ideas I had was trying to make a, a book based all around the unusual articles of Wikipedia. So it's kind of like, um, the, I wouldn't say the history of Wikipedia and like 20 weird articles, but just kind of like trying to highlight all the fascinating things about Wikipedia through the lens of looking at 20 unusual articles in Wikipedia. So if you have any ideas on what those unusual articles would be like. <laughs> but they could be anything from crushing by elephant to buffalo, 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 buffalo. So uh, <laughs> keep thinking of those and uh, let me know if you think of any of those. That could be useful. All right, so thanks for joining us to Wikipedia Weekly. We'll see you next week here on the podcast. Bye. Adios. See you. <laughs>